Honorable Fube. Uh, we just want to hear from you, Honorable, uh, your views on uh, the president's address. What is your takeaway from uh, First thing first, I think the approach matters. Uh, the president came to address, according to Article 8, he came to address the, the House on uh, national values and many other. And there are a lot of things that are linked to national values. But I think I would, uh, I'm, I'm getting worried about the approach that he always uses whenever he comes to the House. He, he has got a virgin stone when he has to talk about the past always, what happened, and you know, I think that for now the president should rest that one because he's a Republican president. And I think he's a president for everybody. He should not use discriminatory language, which, which you know, divides in the citizens into angels and sinners. I think that, that language, he should dump it. Uh, my expectations from the president was that um, I wanted him to talk about, to link the national values, to link about the vices to the cost of living. Because he, these things are interlinked. Uh, when you talk about the cost of living, you are talking about the cost of fuel, you are talking about the cost of miu miu, you are talking about the cost of other essential commodities. And for some of the citizens to acquire those, uh, you know, uh, survival, especially physiological needs, for them to eat, for them to have shelter and the like, they have ventured in, uh, you know, different vices. Uh, it's not because of their fault, it's because the environment is so tough and there is no money in circulation, jobs are few, and economic opportunities are few. And I think what I expected is uh, the president, to, when he was addressing, for instance, the national alcohol policy, when addressing the national alcohol policy and how they are implementing, he talked about awareness, where they have reached out to 500-something. That's a unique number, considering the people, because what I expected from the president is to give us an estimation of people, especially juveniles, who are consuming alcohol, who are underage. And then from there, you would have churned out a statistic of how are we reaching out to those juveniles. Because to me, they have not yet developed a strong, you know, psychological reparent for, for alcohol and other vices. Because alcohol introduces juvenile to testing other drugs. We have seen, like here in urban areas, where we find that the people that have gone to take alcohol have been introduced to things like shisha, and, that, and I think that is also a secondary drug that they are, they are taking, apart from alcohol being a primary drug. And out of that, the behavior is compromised. For instance, we have had a rise uh, in the HIV AIDS statistics, which has not mentioned among the young people, especially those between uh, you know, 15 to 24. There is a rise, and there is no one who can debate about that. That particular trend, especially that we have made headways in terms of uh, defeating HIV and AIDS, and we, are, we have got the 90-90, now it's 95-95, uh, you know, formula. The president would have drawn attention that he, since alcohol is a facilitator to maybe other vices and other behaviors like sex, uh, casual sex, and many other factors would have brought in that question to address how alcohol, if it's not properly handled, you're just talking about the alcohol policy in space, in the vacuum. He needed to put a human face to it so that it has a trickle down effect in terms of impact. And uh, apart from that, I also expected the president to see how are the young people surviving in terms of the cost of living because there are no jobs. Yes, in as far as we have employed 30,000 teachers, in as far as we have employed 11,000 you know, health workers and the like, there is this space that has not been filled, where young, a lot of young people expected that the coming in of a new government. That's why they even voted. Actually, when you look at the numbers of 2.8 uh, million versus 1.8 million, the majority of those are not necessarily their members. Are young people that possibly were expressing hope that should we have a new government, possibly Issues of unemployment, which were created and started during the issue of privatization, uh, privatizing of companies, uh, 225, uh, uh, 225 plus companies that were privatized, and from that time Zambia collapsed and unemployment crept in. Now, the population that is increasing, you know, the president himself talked about 19 million almost, and uh, if the population is 19 million and plus, 
the majority of that number should be young people. And to me, the focus should be young people. If you are talking about economics, let us factor in young people. Even when we are talking about economic governance, it's in disarray as we speak. Arresting the 9.9, 9.29, uh, you know, inflation rate. The dollar is, uh, is one of the fundamental indicators. Uh, dollar versus quacha relationship. The causal relationship, dollar versus, versus quacha, is bad. The essential commodity index price is bad. Those are real issues. It's not about who store what and so forth and the like. This picture will not make us survive for too long. What Zambians want is to deliver. We need to deliver essential commodities, prices so that we are rest. And how we can do that is making sure that we invest in the farming uh, uh, sector, the, the agriculture sector, so that once we are producing enough soybeans, once we are producing enough groundnuts, once we are producing enough uh, sunflower, we are going to arrest the prices of vegetable oils. Cooking oil will go down. Then when we're looking at uh, maize, currently we have a problem where even the fertilizer that was supplied is giving problems with it. Uh, is not properly interacting with the maize. Maize, we should not just look at the component of uh, miu miu, no. From maize, we have byproducts like uh, fish feed. We have byproducts like, uh, you know, chicken feed. Meaning that uh, if we just look at miu miu and we want to reduce the price of miu miu, are we looking at the price of uh, fish feed, which has a bearing on the chicken, which has bearing on the fish that you consume. And uh, if you have ubunga, you also need to know that there is relish that should come in the question. So how is he doing all these factors? So let us not get excited with, uh, you know, some vapor speeches and, and, and vacuum speeches. Yes. Where now? Good afternoon, Honourable. Good afternoon. By the uh, former Minister of Home Affairs, Honourable Stephen Kampiongo, who is a member of Parliament for Shuangandu constituency. Honourable, the President touched on a number of things uh, this uh, morning, and uh, one of the things that he touched on was uh, the issue of the CDF. He did mention that all constituencies have uh, received the CDF. Just to comment on that one, and also the Public Order Act. Uh, the Patriotic Front had started the public, uh, the process of the Public Order Act, and he has urged all of you to unite and uh, ensure that uh, this passes once it's, uh, uh, it's brought back to Parliament. I would like your comment on these two issues. I'll start with the last aspect of unity um, in diversity. Um, is the way to go. I mean, uh, Zambia has been uh, a united nation uh, since independence, and we expect it to continue to be like that. But when we start seeing certain trends that are pointing to aspects of tribalism, regionalism, we have got every right to get concerned. Uh, you have seen the lists of people appointed to public offices circulating in the media and uh, both um, and social media. They start um, bleeding uh, discontentment. And so we would like uh, the president to walk the talk on the, such issues. It shouldn't just be lamentations. His uh, um, speeches must be backed by action uh, and not cosmetic action. That is done to just show that we are doing something to uh, address that aspect of uh, tribalism. But it must be actual action, affirmative action for that matter. Yeah, now coming back to the issues, I, I'm sure you must have seen the reactions. You must have read the reactions from the honorable members, uh, especially on the, his uh, left side of the house when he said CDF has, has, has been implemented in full, uh, members reacted like that because they know what they have been receiving uh, in tranches and um, some constituencies did receive the whole 25 um, million as it were and so those are the reactions you saw from members <laughs> saying look yes the CDF is there, CDF has always been there. And uh, most of us, who are old members of parliament, have done significant things, even with the, the figures that were there in the past. So going forward, we want to see more independence in terms of disbursing this fund. We are waiting to see the law they are trying to bring, um, insofar in, in as CDF is concerned. They are trying to 
uh, review and um, uh, revise the CDF Act. So we have been requested to, 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 to make submissions. We want to make sure that central government remains a central government. Local government as local government. We don't expect that kind of interference. The local authorities need to just be capacitated so that they can implement the projects that are recommended to, the, to, the, to them by the CDF committees in various constituencies. So we, and its disbursement of funds must be done at once so that um, the projects are done. But what we have seen again is this centralized way of doing things where the, the, the ministry continues to send circulars of what needs to be done. Out of the CDF, you must buy this, you must do that, you must build a house for the chiefs. You must. So, in short, there is, seems to be a desire by government to use CDF as an implementing tool for the decentralization policy, which is a standalone policy. And if it's implemented, we don't mind as honorable members of parliament receiving even lesser much lesser funds, because when centralized, centralized governance functions are implemented and matching resources are given, we don't need to have this burden as members of parliament to do with all the development that is required in a constituency. So we want the, the, the government to be decisive on the implementation of decentralization policy. It is well structured, and once it is done, matching resources given to the structures of government the CDF issue will neither be here nor there. So that's my comment on the CDF. You talked about the, the, the public order acts. Correct, like you said, we, it, was, it is work in, in progress. It should be work in progress because a lot of work was done with various, the same stakeholders they are consulting are the same stakeholders that were consulted even at that point. Interparliamentary Union was involved. They okayed the document. I brought the bill, the draft bill, which went up to the second reading. It was only deferred at the request of our colleagues then in, um, in opposition. And precisely the current Minister of Home Affairs is the one that requested for the deferment so that we could deal with the constitutional amendments first before we could get to the public order. So that's where we are. Let them just bring it, we shall see. And it's something that is, uh, 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 is going to be supported because it's not... For us only, it's for the members of the public. And the president uh, spoke, as you know, you're a former minister of home affairs, the president spoke about, uh, you know, uh, the prisons and how he has, uh, his government has uh, responded to the needs for, you know, bunker beds and so forth and so on. Uh, how, how does that make you feel as a former, uh, uh, minister of home affairs? Are you patting him on the back for such things? First, before I speak about the correction service, it's talked about the abolition of the death penalty. We cannot say we have abolished the death penalty when part three of the, cons the old constitution still stands as it is. Because the death penalty is uh, all the subsidiary legislation that has been dealt with, the CPC, Criminal Procedure Code, we are driving their provisions from the constitution, which is part three. So if we leave the constitution as it is, we can't claim to have abolished the death penalty. So it has to be amended? It has to be amended. And as it's long as it stands as it is, that's why we, as government uh, then, couldn't vote for either death penalty or against at the United Nations. Why? Because we have had it on the statutes, despite observing the moratorium. The moratorium has been observed since 1997, when the last death warrant was signed by the then President Chiruba. All the successive presidents, President Mwanawasa, President Sata, well, President Rupia Banda, including President Lungu, never uh, signed any death warrant. So there has been this moratorium, which means all those that were on death row have had only their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. It's not the first time the president should not know, should know. It's not the first time that those powers were being used. Uh, when we're saying, no, we committed, commutations have always been there before. And the previous presidents have done that before. So it's important to acknowledge what others have done as you are priding yourself for what you are doing. Um, so there lies the problem. 
until we deal with part three, then we can say we have done away with it completely. So that's what I can say about death penalty. Correction service. What are you are calling it for correction service now? Why? Because there's been a lot of work, a drastic shift from prisons to correction services. We passed the laws here and then we made sure that we embarked on what I would call physical transformation. Today, you, can't, you, you, you have seen the relocation of uh, inmates from Kamwala Adman prison because we have left new facilities in Mwembesh, bigger facilities. You go there, it's a marvel. And it's always important to, to, to appreciate these things. So those mattresses and back of it are going to be bought because they are facilities that are new where they are going, which we left behind. It, it was something that I think historically we shall pride ourselves that we are the first government to open doors to new correction facilities uh, since independence. I would have loved the president to remove himself in that, from that debate because he was trying to attach emotions and put himself in the debate um, as he was talking about the correction facilities. I mean, we have the Mandelas of this world, you know, and you saw what they left behind after the, their incarceration for many years. No one wants to arrest people and put them behind bars. We are not complaining. We have been arrested before. We have been tried, you know, long months. We are not complaining. We have understood that they are applying the law, as it were. So the president must remove his emotional, uh, um, personal emotions when he's talking about these matters so that they can, we can appreciate his, uh, his discourse. But otherwise, we acknowledge the procurement of mattresses because the facilities we left, the choir mattresses. Now the service is attractive. If you see the men and women working for the correction uh, for, uh, for, uh, service now, it's attractive. They have got accommodation that was not there before. The uniforms, the equipment for farming, which then helps in transforming offenders into law-abiding citizens should they be given chance to come to society. This is the work that we did, and the record is there. So we acknowledge the mattresses. <laughs> we wish we could have talked about starting another new facility somewhere of the correction service so that the congestion that has been there historically can now be eradicated. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. But lastly, 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 you know, the, the president wanted to attempt, when we talk about dignity, what dignifies a human being huh, is how you as a family are looking after yourselves. The key issue is the stomach. There's no human being who claim to be uh, in dignity without food. Food destabilizes nations. And so the president must apply his mind and his government should apply their mind on how they are going to ensure that there's food security. We didn't condemn them for exporting, but we told them that you can only export when you have got surplus. That was our contention. When we told them that don't export the maize before you know what it takes to produce this maize, we knew what was going to happen because we have been in government before. Here we are today. We opened the borders, exported maize, now we don't have maize to, to, to give the millers. We don't have maize to give the, the, the national service uh, plants that we left behind to mitigate the food challenges. So these are issues that we sh should have spoken to. Njala. Njala removes dignity from people. It removes dignity from people. So as we talk about how we should live as families, why are we having so many street children? There are so many street kids that are not supposed to be on the street. You go to Cafe Roundabout there, see how the chaps are jumping in the, in the, in the fountain there as a swimming pool. They have run away from homes. There is no food. They are coming to beg from the street. So we need to have collected efforts. We agree with them to deal with these issues. But let's do things right, as he says himself. You can't export before you know what you have. Now you have seen this guy locating of prices of minimum. 
Even when the president, uh, the vice president says the correct thing about diet, it's misunderstood because it's said at a wrong time. If it was a very right one where people can afford Dora meal and breakfast, then people understand it in a proper context. So these are the issues that we need to deal with so that uh, the, the dignity of people is appreciated. Thank you so much, Thank you, we are good. <laughs>